Abraham. What's a little bit more forces? Well, forces of love. Not hate. No. Hate, hate is delegated to the others outside. I could see from afar, looking up Wilhelmstraße towards Unter den Linden, how there was hundred thousand of people when they passed Hitler, they just became completely delirious. They began to shout these cries, I will never get out of my ears. Heil, Sieg, Heil, that is demented. And here I got confirmation how those irrational forces, uncontrollable forces in Germany, in the Germans, had erupted, had broken out, were running wild, were departing, marching, marching on. And in America too, democracy was under threat from the force of the angry mob. The effect of the stock market crash had been disastrous. There was growing violence as an angry population took out their frustration on the corporations who were seen to have caused this disaster. Then, in 1932, a new president was elected who was also going to use the power of the state to control the free market. But his aim was not to destroy democracy, but to strengthen it. And to do this, he was going to develop a new way of dealing with the masses. I am prepared, under my constitutional duty, to recommend the measures that a stricken nation in the midst of a stricken world may require. But in the event that the national emergency is still critical, I shall not evade the clear course of duty that will then confront me. I shall ask the Congress for the one remaining instrument to meet the crisis. Broad executive power. It was the start of what would become known as the New Deal. Roosevelt assembled a group of young technocrats and planners in Washington. He told them that their job was to plan and run giant new industrial projects for the good of the nation. Roosevelt was convinced that the stock market crash had shown that laissez-faire capitalism could no longer run modern industrial economies. It had become the job of government. Big business was horrified, but the New Deal attracted the admiration of the Nazis, especially Joseph Goebbels. Wir betrachten die wirtschaftliche Entwicklung in Amerika mit dem allergrößten positiven Interesse. Und wir sind dort der festen Überzeugung, dass Präsident Roosevelt und seine Berater auf dem richtigen Wege sind. Es handelt sich in der Tat um das größte wirtschaftliche und soziale Problem aller Zeiten. Die vielen Millionen Arbeitslosen, die ihre Plätze an den Maschinen und in den Kontoren verloren haben, wieder an ihre alten Arbeitsstellen zurückzuführen. Das kann nicht allein der privaten Initiative überlassen werden. Ausschlaggebend ist, dass die öffentliche Hand mit positiven Maßnahmen eingreift. But although Roosevelt, like the Nazis, was trying to organize society in a different way, unlike the Nazis, he believed that human beings were rational and could be trusted to take an active part in government. Roosevelt believed it was possible to explain his policies to ordinary Americans and take into account their opinions. To do this, he was helped by the new ideas of an American social scientist called George Gallup favorite reading of New Deal Washington, the survey of U.S. public opinion. From offices at Princeton, New Jersey, a famed statistician, Dr. George Gallup, tells Washington from week to week what the nation is thinking. 
And in New York, Fortune Magazine's analyst, Elmo Roper, compiles for publication a continuous record of the nation's approval or disapproval of how the country is being run. Gallup and Roper rejected Bernays' view that human beings were at the mercy of unconscious forces and so needed to be controlled. Their system of opinion polling was based on the idea that people could be trusted to know what they wanted. They argued that one could measure and predict the opinions and behaviour of the public if one asked strictly factual questions and avoided manipulating their emotions. Well, how about this one? Do you think Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal has been bad for the nation in general? No, that question's loaded. It automatically suggests an answer. Well, how about this? Is your present feeling toward President Roosevelt one of general approval or general disapproval? That's better. Prior to scientific polling, the view of, of, of many people was that um, you couldn't trust public opinion. It was irrational that uh, it was ill-informed, chaotic, unruly, and so forth. And, and so that opinion should be dismissed. But with scientific polling, um, I think it established very clearly that uh, people do are rational, that they do make good decisions, and this offers democracy a chance to be truly informed by the public, giving everybody a voice in the way the country is run. I know my father wouldn't necessarily say the voice of the public is the voice of God, but he, he did feel very much that the, the voice of the, of the people is, is a rational voice and should be heard. What Roosevelt was doing was forging a new connection between the masses and politicians. No longer were they irrational consumers who were managed by sating their desires. Instead, they were sensible citizens who could take part in the governing of the country. In 1936, Roosevelt stood for re-election. He promised further control over big business. To the corporations, it was the beginning of a dictatorship. Roosevelt interferes with private enterprise and is running the country into debt for generations to come. The way to get recovery is to let business alone. But Roosevelt was triumphantly re-elected. It looks, my friends, like a real landslide this time. So please let me, let me thank you again and tell you that I hope to see you all very soon and bid you an affectionate good night. Faced with this, business now decided to fight back, to regain power in America. At the heart of the battle would be Edward Bernays and the profession he had invented, public relations. Following that election, business people start to get together and start to carry on discussions, primarily in private, and they start talking to each other about the need to sort of carry on uh, ideological warfare against the New Deal and to sort of reassert the sort of connectedness between the idea of democracy on the one hand and the idea of privately owned business on the other. And so, under the umbrella of an organization which still exists, which is called the National Association of Manufacturers, and whose membership included all of the major corporations of the United States, a campaign is launched explicitly designed to create emotional attachments between the public and big business. It's Bernays' techniques being used on a grand scale. I mean, totally. General Motors' parade of progress, traveling the high roads and by roads of America, bringing to millions of Americans in their own hometown the fascinating story behind modern industry, showing... The campaign set out to show dramatically that it was business, not politicians, who had created modern America. A better mode of living for all of us. Bernays was an advisor to General Motors, but he was no longer alone. The industry he had founded now flourished as hundreds of public relations advisers organized a vast campaign. They not only used advertisements and billboards, but managed to insinuate their message into the editorial pages of the newspapers. It became a bitter fight. In response to the campaign, the government made films, 
that warned of the unscrupulous manipulation of the press by big business. And the central villain was the new figure of the public relations man. They tried to achieve their ends by working entirely behind the scenes, corrupting and deceiving the public. The aims of such groups may be either good or bad, so far as the public interest is concerned, but their methods are a grave danger to democratic institutions. The films also showed how the responsible citizen could monitor the press themselves. They could create a chart that analysed the reporting for signs of hidden bias. But such earnest instruction was to be no match for the powerful imagination of Edward Bernays. He was about to help create a vision of the utopia that free market capitalism would build in America if it was unleashed. In 1939, New York hosted the World's Fair. Edward Bernays was a central advisor. He insisted that the theme be the link between democracy and American business. At the heart of the fair was a giant white dome that Bernays named Democracy City. And the central exhibit was a vast working model of America's future, constructed by the General Motors Corporation. To my father, the World's Fair was an opportunity to keep the status quo, that is, capitalism in a democracy. Democracy and, and capitalism, that marriage, right, linking, like, just like that. He did that by manipulating people and getting them to think that you couldn't have real democracy in anything but a capitalist society, which was capable of doing anything, of creating these wonderful highways, of, of making, you know, moving pictures inside everybody's house, of, of telephones that didn't need cords, of sleek roadsters. I mean, it was, it, they were, it was, a, it, was con, it was consumerist, but at the same time, you inferred that in a funny way, democracy and capitalism went together. The World's Fair was an extraordinary success and captured America's imagination. The vision it portrayed was of a new form of democracy in which business responded to people's innermost desires in a way politicians could never do. But it was a form of democracy that depended on treating people not as active citizens, as Roosevelt did, but as passive consumers. Because this, Bernays believed, was the key to control in a mass democracy. It's not that the people are in charge, but that the people's desires are in charge. The people are not in charge. The people exercise no decision-making power within this environment. So democracy is reduced from something which assumes an active citizenry to the idea of the public as passive consumers. Oh! Driven primarily by instinctual or unconscious desires and that if you can in fact trigger those needs and desires, you can get what you want from them. But this struggle between the two views of human beings as to whether they were rational or irrational was about to be dramatically affected by events in Europe. Events that would also change the fortunes of the Freud family. In March 1938, the Nazis annexed Austria. It was called the Anschluss. Hitler arrived in Vienna to an extraordinary outpouring of mass adulation. But even as he drove through the city, Behind the scenes, the Nazis were systematically whipping up and unleashing the hatred of the crowd against the enemies of the new Greater Germany. The Anschluss was a kind of explosion of terrible hatred against the enemies, the so-called enemies or whatever they considered enemies, against the Jews in, in, in totally, and also uh, against a lot of very decent Austrians who had opposed the Nazis in Austria. 
They said it's legitimate, now you can do what you want. So they did it. Stealing, robbing and killing, I c can't say it otherwise. And human depravity, of course, is uh, always near, very near to, to, to normal behavior. It, be, it can change very quickly. As the violence and assassinations raged in Vienna, Freud decided he had to leave. His aim was to go to Britain, but he knew that Britain, like many countries, was refusing entry to most Jewish refugees. But help came from the leading psychoanalyst in Britain, Ernest Jones. He was in the same ice skating club as the Home Secretary, Sir Samuel Hoare, and Jones persuaded Hoare to issue Freud a British work permit. And in May 1938, Freud, his daughter Anna, and other members of his family set off for London. Freud arrived in London as Britain was preparing for war, and he settled with his daughter Anna in a house in Hampstead. But Freud's cancer was now far advanced, and in September 1939, just three weeks after the outbreak of war, he died. The Second World War would utterly transform the way governments saw democracy and the people they governed. Next week's programme will show how the American government, as a result of the war, became convinced there were savage, dangerous forces hidden inside all human beings. Forces that needed to be controlled. The terrible evidence from the death camps seemed to show what happened when these forces were unleashed and politicians and planners in post-war America would come to believe that hidden under the surface of their own population were the same dangerous forces. And they would turn to the Freud family to help control this enemy within. And ever adaptable, Edward Bernays would work not just for the American government, but the CIA. And Sigmund Freud's daughter, Anna, would also become powerful in the United States because she believed that people could be taught to control the irrational forces within them. Out of this would come vast government programs to manage the inner psychological life of the masses. The Century of the Self continues next Sunday night on BBC Two, same time, 8 o'clock. Tonight, the final part of SAS, next.